Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Um, today we're going to go further with, uh, let's say, part two of, with regards to zeal. The previous devotional, I was speaking about the weight of eternal glory and how that is actually um, what everything hinges upon with regards to the kingdom of God. And if we are not apprehended by the the knowledge and the, the knowing and the, the weight of the fact that we are going to be kings and priests of this kingdom of God that's coming down, um, then how will we endure? Because there has to be something greater than ourselves, a cause greater than us, a cause or something greater than anything he would do um, through us, something just greater that we are fighting for. And the word says that the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So I was speaking the last time about zeal and that this zeal has to do with uh, or have to do with, um, with the kingdom of God and that we need to be apprehended by that. And we need to seek that. We need to seek to be apprehended by that fact that we're going to be kings and priests of the kingdom of God. So today we're going to continue um, with the same subject with regards to zeal, which in the end is that of endurance. And the last time um, I spoke about zeal and the, the Greek name for zeal is zelos. And I explained that in the Strong's Concordance that it means boiling water, um, burning hot, um, the burning of the inner man, um, even indignation. So zeal is very much a driving force, something that causes you to be able to overcome. And we know that the word says that, um, that when we endure, we shall receive a crown and that the overcomers receive a crown. And so this endurance will not come easily. You know, endurance actually means at the heart of it, that when you have come to the end of yourself, of all your abilities, the end of where you come to the point where you realize there is just absolutely nothing. You've got no strength, no ability to go even further. That at that point, you are actually able to stand up from that place where you're at and continue. And not just continue, but continue stronger and stronger and stronger. This can only be done um, by the grace of God. But our minds, our hearts have to be apprehended by the kingdom of God, the fact that there is such a thing as the kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. We're fighting for the kingdom of God. So today we're going to go further with regards. I would say it's probably another, the other side of the coin where the kingdom of God is the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin would be the king. So it's the king and his kingdom. So today we're going to, I suppose, address that zeal for the king. And the last time I mentioned that in Matthew 3, that Yeshua, right um, at the end of Matthew 3, um, it speaks of um, how Yeshua was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him and like a dove and out of the clouds we hear, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And what does the Spirit do then after that? He leads him into the, the wilderness to be tempted. And, uh, you know, I wonder how many times we've read that and not really grasped the, the reality of it. The Spirit leading Yeshua into the wilderness for that specific purpose. And the last time I mentioned that the, the, the wilderness is for that purpose. It is for trials and it is for testing. So both those things. And if you look at the, the when it comes to trials, trials very much is suffering, persecution, um, ridicule, those kind of things, um, trauma, and the tribulation, very much a wilderness period, without a doubt, <laughs> will be identified as the time of greatest trouble and tribulation. And um, so it will be an immense trial. So what is actually grown and uh, um, tried in the wilderness through trials is our faith. It's our faith that is constantly being purified by the fire of tribulation. And we know that the word says that our faith that is tried is more precious than fine gold. Um, that it, 
our faith in circumstances where we no longer can endure and we still believe, we still hold on to him, that this is such a sweet smelling favor, savor to him. And so this in this time of the wilderness, without a doubt, our, our faith will once again be tested through the trials to not give up. And uh, I once heard that the word, uh, somebody say that through suffering reveals and ultimate suffering reveals ultimately. And we can, we can really prepare us for the time to come. We can only prepare to, to a certain degree. But when we are going to be in those circumstances, what will be written on our faces when calamity happens, when something happens? will be the ultimate expression of our true reality, of our true state of our heart. You know, in the case with Peter, when he denied the Lord, at that moment, beforehand, he was saying, I will even go to jail to you and I will die for you. And he meant it. It was said with utmost sincerity. And it's not because um, he wasn't willing. He was willing. But the point is, when it came down to the nitty gritty, what was exposed was his true state. It was his true state. And it was an absolute mercy. So in the time to come, we have to understand that absolutely nothing will happen to us that have not gone through the Father first in order to get to us. We will not be victims to uh, circumstances. Um, you can just imagine the angelic realm, what it will be like. Our angels will be given charge over his children, even more so, a hosts. Um, we will, yes, we will be as lambs for the slaughter. We will be persecuted and all those things. But still, nothing will be allowed to come our way, which is not divinely allowed by the Father, unless obviously we leave a door open. So our faith will be tried to the utmost. But now at the same time, um, Yeshua was sent to be tempted in the wilderness. So temptation has everything to do with the trying of our love, of our devotion. So this is the part where the zeal comes in with regards to the king. So let's read. If you look at... Um, uh, the first church mentioned in Revelations 2, the golden uh, candlestick with the seven uh, candlesticks that represent, represents the, the seven churches, we will find that we are going to go and start with the apostolic age, with the church of Ephesus, the things that through the tribulation, it will literally work through all those churches as well. So that which was will be again. So the church of Ephesus is the first church that is mentioned, the apostolic, apostolic church. So let's read what Yeshua said to John with regards to this church, because it will be again, and that's in Revelations 2. Um, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This is what he says to the church of Ephesus. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. There's that endurance, right? And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So it stands to reason that the first, uh, uh, um, the, the starting point of the tribulation will once again be the Acts 2 uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the apostles that will be sent out and the prophets. That in this time, the word says that there will be many uh, false prophets and false apostles, which we see now today. They will be found out by the true apostles that will be anointed. Okay, so... He's, he's uh, applauding them. He's saying, I, I see how hard you work. I see how you endure. I see how you expose the works of the enemy and those that are false apostles. But he says to them, and you have borne and have patience and have for my name's sake have labored. He says, I see how difficult it has been for you. And you have not fainted. So you see the whole uh, 
the whole focus here is endurance and exposing the works of the enemy. But then he says in verse 4, nevertheless, now nevertheless means in spite of everything that you've been doing for me, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do not and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If, like I say, that the time is coming very soon, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out, and that the apostles will be sent out, it stands to reason that this disposition of the church of Ephesus is already in the works, that they are already those um, who are readily exposing the works of the enemy, who is enduring already, you know, the race has already started, so to speak. The, the disposition has already been uh, um, nurtured and grown and a focus is there. But at the same time, the, the, the love, the, the, the first love that is like a flame that has died down a bit is also at the same time um, starting to happen in various of his um, workers and the church. And we know the church in general. And so today I'm very much going to speak um, to the workers, but obviously it's applicable to, to, to everybody. Because I want, uh, Father has put it upon my heart that we need to understand we don't have it made. <laughs> we, we need to understand it's going to be a great time of testing, um, of temptation. Think of the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. What happened is that they longed, they desired the flesh pots of Egypt. You can imagine um, after so much manna um, how they had in their mind's eye they just saw this lush meat and vegetables and, 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 and what they could eat in Egypt and how they longed for it. You can imagine sitting in a concentration camp in the time to come or sitting in a cave, hiding away or in a hut or somewhere, a tent, who knows, and you haven't had a decent meal for so long, the, how great the temptation is, just like them, to long for that again and to grow bitter in their heart. The word says that they grew bitter in their hearts. Now, that's not an instant process, but it does happen. And so they were longing for that again. And what happened is that as they went in their journey through the wilderness eventually even snakes the Lord sent snakes that bit them because he could not handle this moaning and groaning he couldn't handle the fact that they didn't believe that the same God who got them out of Egypt will get them out of the wilderness and if we look at their circumstances we can blame them I mean we can we can easily read the word and and just say you know they're so ungrateful you know, look what he, how he saved them. But, I mean, to live in a wilderness for 40 years and to endure that is quite a different story. So, shouldn't be quick to judge. If you look at uh, uh, um, Revelations 2, where it, uh, where it speaks to the church of Ephesus, we see that there's a great zeal for the work that they did for the Lord. There was a great zeal to expose the enemy um, and an endurance, absolute zeal, but the zeal for him wasn't there. And like I said, you know, there's the zeal for the kingdom of God, and then there's the zeal for the king. And both the, these two have to be in conjunction with each other through this time, and both will be tested. And the, the, the fire um, grew cold. And I can, you know, if you think of when you make a fire, you go camping or you've got a fireplace at home and you 
you're busy with things and after a while um, you realize it's getting cold in the room it's not as hot as anymore and uh, you you look and you see but the ash has gotten so much that the fire has you know has lost its uh, potency and its heat and just like a little simmering coals there what do you do you you move the ash away and you blow a bit upon it and you put extra wood on and there you go it starts the fire again and if I think of the ash, I think of, of Job, you know, he, he sat on an ash heap and he, he was um, just absolutely, and Job is a good example of, of the tribulation, what will be. Um, and, and being so overwhelmed by your circumstances, very much that ash could be the trials, you know, we can see it as symbolic of the trials that will be so heavy that it will easily just dim the love that we have for him it can be so overwhelming that you lose sight and that that fire and that zeal in your heart for him will start growing cold every day little by little by little you know if you um, people that have been exposed to tremendous suffering come to a point where they no longer want to hope hope even to hope is painful for them so you can imagine how that love will just start growing cold and colder and colder. Because where is he? Why isn't he answering? And the cry of the people at that time will be, God has forsaken us. God has forsaken us. And will they be able to look to us and say, we don't have hope, but why do you have hope? You're going through exactly the same that we're going through. How come you have hope? And we need to be able, not just by our words, knowing what the right thing is to say, our very lives have to be the living epistle that they read, that they can see these people have hope. And not that we're going to be perfect. There will probably be times that that we will have our moments of breaking down. Because we're real, hey? Eh? Real. <laughs> but the ability to endure, to get up. So, um, it starts when you think of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I remember the day the Lord showed me that and I, it was for me quite profound. When you read 1 Corinthians 13, it starts with, though I have the tongues of angels and um, I have faith to move mountains and um, I have all the knowledge and understanding mysteries. I mean, those are profound things. And it says, then I'm just a clinging symbol. And then it says, you know, if I give my body to be burned or I give all my goods to the poor and I have not love, um, I am nothing. And that it says, um, love bears all things, believes all things, it hopes all things, love endures all things. Oh, it's just profound. If you really study that, and if you look at the uh, what is said right at the beginning, I mean, giving your body to be burned, giving your clothes of your back or all your goods, or being able to do miracles and wonders and have understanding, those are quite profound things to be able to do that. And this is right in conjunction with Ephes the Ephesus church. They could do all these things, but he said to them, nevertheless, you have forsaken your first love. And in the same way, Paul is saying here, yeah, even if you can do all these things and you have not, not love, you are nothing. Because it's that love, his love for us and our love for him that will cause us to endure all things, believe all things, hope all things. And bear all things, bear under it, bear under his yoke, whatever he may bring our path, on our path. So you see the conjunction with that. He's constantly saying, yes, I will use you greatly. Yes, you will do mighty things. Yes, you will expose the works of the enemy. But if you do not have a love, a fervent love and zeal for me, it will be for nothing. It will mean nothing. So let's read a bit about this love in the Song of Solomon. What better place to read about it than there? So let's go to Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 5. Now, the reason why I want to go to that particular scripture is because if you think of when a, a, a couple has been married for years, let's say 22 years, 25 years, 27 years, and one day your spouse come, 
comes to you and says to you, um, it's not working for me anymore. I, I don't love you anymore. And then the golden words, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> where does that leave you? Where does that leave you? you? You're at a place where you can't tell that person to love you. It's their choice. And, you know, there's nothing you can do because they just told you now it's not you. You're not doing anything wrong. So the question we need to ask ourselves, I mean, how does something like that happen? You know, and I suppose many people say, well, we just we just no longer made any effort with one another. We we just took one another for granted or so many things happened between us that the love grew cold. That's the trials, right? The ashes. And. I've, I've thought about it and I, I realized that how I was thinking about how does love begin, you know, and the thought came was that there are two people and it starts with one look. Um, they look at each other and the one they catch each other's eye and there's something about that person, either their look or their persona or something that draws your attention. And you're attracted to that person. And obviously a look becomes a gaze. And a gaze becomes a being lost in each other's eyes. I always think um, falling in love is one of the most beautiful things um, that the Lord God has made. That ability to fall in love. And so um, it starts with a look. Without even one word said. It just starts with a look. And... Yeshua talks about um, that our eye must be single and it speaks about a, a devotion unto me and that single eye is a reference to dove eyes. Now a dove doesn't have a peripheral uh, vision, it can only see one thing at a time so it cocks its head in order to look at something. So if, it throw, if you throw something on the, on the ground and it wants to see it, it won't look straight at it, it will uh, uh, turn its head to be able to see it. And um, so it can only see one thing uh, at a time. And, and he's saying to us that he has dove eyes towards us and the bride has dove eyes towards him. So let's read about that. That's in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, the right uh, No, that is not the right one. Maybe it's 5 as 1. Let me see. There we go. He calls uh, uh, 5 verse 1 and 2. Let's read that. He says, I'm coming to my God and my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. Let's go to 5 verse 12. She's speaking of him now. And he's, he's letting us know this is how he looks on us. His eyes are the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. Now this fitly set, um, in the commentary they say it's like, it's like a gem that is set in something. Now we know a dove has a ring around the eye and, and it looks like a gem that is set. And um, it's, with, it's washed with milk, so that milk speaks of purity. So it's with pure eyes, um, like jewels, that he, that he looks on the, on the blood, on his beloved. And then uh, chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. So he says, if you just look at me with those eyes that's so devoted to me, that's so in love with me, you ravish my heart. You know, if you think of when a couple is in love, you know, just one look, whew, what that does to the heart. So he's, he's, he wants us in this time to actually 
remain and, and, and endure in that disposition of being in love with him. Um, if, if you uh, classic example now uh, with Romeo and Juliet, you know, how the couples that love each other are willing to die for each other. And didn't Yeshua say that um, in John 15? He says, Nobody has greater love than he who lays his life down for his friend. You are my friends. Okay, so let's read 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1, and we're going to start with 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So he's telling them to stir up the gift. And when I looked this stir up, I looked it up in the Strongs, it speaks of actually rekindling a fire and that you need to remove the ashes. So in the same way, uh, Paul is here speaking and he's saying that the gift has to be stirred up. And so Yeshua is saying to us in this time, you need to read the scriptures, not just as, uh, as, uh, as history, uh, uh, doc, you know, documenting history and what happened, but also in the East to come. So read Timothy as all the scriptures as when you are in tribulation, this is what you are reading for yourself to listen to. He's saying stir up that gift because he's not giving you a spirit of fear. Think of how rampant fear will be. But of power of love and a sound mind. And when you read further on in this chapter, it starts, let me see, where is that? Uh, he talks about these two men that actually fell away. He says that um, in Asia, um, that the people in Asia fell away from him. And Phegelos and Fergonon were then their names. Let me see where that is. Okay, verse 15. Verse 15, he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and her, or Phygelus, depending on how you pronounce it, and Hermogenes. Now, Phygelus means little fugitive. <laughs> on the run he went. And Hermogenes means, um, I can't remember what does Hermogenes mean, but I know it also means that he, uh, in the Strongs it says that he was an apostate Christian. So in this time, there will be those, and he says, those in Asia turned away from Paul. And remember, Paul is an extension of Christ. He's the resurrection, the man of the resurrection, if I can put it that way. And here they are, and they fell away. They went away, and they no longer followed the doctrine. And, and this is the, the greatest time of testing and trial. So this is why he's mentioning to them that they need to stir up the gift Okay, we know it's the Spirit. It's the Spirit. And the Word says He gives this, His Spirit to those who obey Him. And that it is the Spirit that pours out the love of God into our hearts. We need to stir. How much are we going to need in the time to come to stir up that? Um, to allow the Spirit of God to rekindle our, our, um, our love for Him continually. You know, it's something that, that needs to be guarded. Um, I find it interesting that um, Charles Spurgeon, he, he wrote, I don't know if it's a sermon, um, but he was speaking, he called it ministerialism, where he said he, he, he caught himself where he would read the word of God and he would, when he read it, he read it in order to think of how am I going to do my next uh, 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 sermon? How is this applicable to my congregation? And he stopped applying the word of God to his own heart. He was always thinking of, how am I going to use this for others? Now, it's very easy to fall into that trap, into that way of thinking, because your mindset is that of wanting, wanting to help others and to minister to others. And that you later on, 
uh, forget to use the word of God as a mirror unto yourself. You, you, you read something, but you, your first modus of operandi is to think of how is this applicable to others because you want to serve others. And that is a great danger. We first have to read it for ourselves. So for instance, when Father gives me a word to give to people, I always have the responsibility of going to myself and say, how is this applicable to me? Because when I speak that word, it has to be in authenticity. It has to be true about myself first, because then I'm not a pure vessel. It has to come out of a pure vessel. I have to allow him to try me first. So in the same way as ministers, we need to be able to first use the word and, and, and keep it as a mirror before ourselves. So it's very easy in the time to come that we will be so busy ministering to people and there will be lot to minister to that you forget about your own heart and the word says out of the heart flows the issues of life everything will come from out of this heart and if this heart starts to grow cold in the midst of tribulation without you being aware of it because you're so busy then we stand the chance that that we will start to fall away just like Fergonon and Fergillis was his name funny name okay and when I was, uh, Father was preparing this, this uh, devotional in my heart, he, he took me to Luke 22. Now let's read that in Luke 22, he was speaking to Peter. Now Peter, we know, represents the church as a whole. He can represent the left behind church as well, but he also represents the church as a whole. And we know that um, just by the examples that I've given now, that everybody will be subject to being tested in the wilderness. So in Luke 22 verse 31 and 32, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, the old Satan hath desired to have you. Now that desired means to beg or to implore or demand. Very uh, uh, persistent that the enemy was. He came to the Lord and say, I want him given to me i want to sift him and that's exactly what's going to happen right so he desires satan will desire to do it to the church he is demanding it okay so this is a type and shadow of what's to come and he says that he may sift you as wheat so we know it's the wheat harvest that will be brought in so this is the wheat that will be sifted but i have prayed for thee thank you lord so i've prayed for thee that thy faith Fail not, right? What is going to be tested in this time? Our faith. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthened by brethren. He's saying, you're going to be tested. Your faith is going to be tested. And I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Know that he's praying for us in this time. That our faith will not fail. But he says, once you've been converted, once the process of your faith that has been tested, every time, every time there will be a conversion that takes place. There will be change. There will be maturity. You either fall back or you will grow. That's, there's the only op option. And, and stagnation is also falling back. So um, once you've been converted, strengthen your brethren. Now that strengthen means to... Uh, um, Make them as pillars. It means to establish them, make them strong, build them up. So whatever we will be going through, every time our faith will be tested in, in, in the wilderness time, even now, we see the example as, as we live our day-to-day -day lives. How much more then? Every time something happens to us where our faith are tested, it is for the purpose to convert us so that we may strengthen one another. It will be exactly the same, however amplified. Okay? So, this made me think very much of Job as well. How the enemy came to the Lord God and, and the Lord God said to him, so what you've been up to? And he said he was being going to and fro. And the Lord God said, have you seen my righteous servant? You know, And he said, yeah, I, I don't think he's so righteous because, you know, you've got this hedge around him and uh, there's no ways I can get to him. So how can you say, you know, I haven't tried him. And the Lord God, as we know, um, have allowed it um, or allowed it. And, uh, and in the end, um, 
you know, Job said, I, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now I see and I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So there was a conversion that took place, and after that conversion, um, he received a double. So all this is the process that the Lord will take us through, even in the time to come. It, it, the process in the wilderness will still be a time of much growth in tribulation. We will not have arrived just because we've been filled with the Spirit, just because we'll be able to do great wonders and miracles and stuff like that. It will still be a time of testing. We have the example of the Word of God. Um, Paul went through Alangon. <laughs> he went through flogging, shipwreck, you name it, right? Um, Peter, I mean, he was crucified upside down and, he, and they, he, they were persecuted. All the apostles, all the prophets have one thing in common and that's persecution. But they also have glory and, and, and miracles and great things in common. So suffering and glory goes together. Weakness and strength goes together. So the, these things will all glorify the Lord God. Because in the end, there's only one that is to get the glory. We will constantly be placed in a place of weakness. The Lord God knows that if he's going to use us mightily, he has to humble us greatly. I'm going to say that again. If he's going to use us mightily, he has to humble us greatly. This is what it will be for, to keep us on the track. Okay. So what if you go to John 21... Right at the end, after Peter has been tried and sifted, um, you can just imagine Peter is standing outside of the temple, warming himself at the coals with this servant lady. Asking, well, aren't you one of them? And obviously we know what happened there. And, and when I looked up this word coals, it actually refers to uh, Romans 12, where it talks about that we should love our enemy and pray for our enemy because it's like coals that we put on their heads. Um, it, it, it means that it, it, it places such a guilt because of the mercy that is shown. And that, that brings conversion, right? And we find in John 21 where um, Peter, he decided, okay, that's it. He's going fishing back to his old job. He's now, you know, this is not for him. He's had enough. He, he can't do this. And some of the disciples says, okay, right, we will go with you. And so they spent the whole night fishing or keeping the boat warm. And there was no fish and Yeshua came and told them obviously that they need to put the net on the other side and they caught 153 fish. And so who was waiting on the shore for Peter? Well, it was Yeshua. And what was he doing? He was busy preparing a meal on coals. So this is the coals that were on his enemy's head. Not that Peter was his enemy, but Peter denied him. And so Yeshua showed him love. He showed him love. By making a covenant meal with him. Always a meal. Every time Yeshua makes a meal, shares a meal with us. Meals is, uh, represent covenant. So he's, he's, he's preparing a meal for Peter. And, and he says to him, after this temptation, what does he ask him? Peter, not, did you keep on believing in me? Peter, did you endure? Peter, did you do great miracles after this? No, he said, Peter... Do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, I love you. And he asked him three times, because we know he denied him three times. And in the last time he said to him, Lord, you know. You know. Because Peter was so humbled by this, because he understood, no matter how much he confesses his love, no matter how much, the, whatever he could do for the Lord, the heart of man is before God. And he sees all things. He knows the truth of our heart. And Yeshua said to him, Feed my sheep. Strengthen the brethren. As he said to him, after you converted, because that was the conversion, the conversion was a zeal and a love for the one who made covenant with him. Not just with fish and bread, but with his body. There was a fervency and enduring love 
of zeal that burned so hot after that, after that which happened to him, all the trials and testing created in him a fervency for Yeshua, a zeal to endure. The Peter before the cross that said he would die for him and the Peter after the cross, two different Peters, two different Peters. The Peter after the cross walked in resurrection life and he walked in the love of God, his love and fervency, because he knew who he was. And that is what caused him to endure. So let's read James 1, the well-known scripture that we often go to when we're going through um, very difficult times. Okay, verse 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, is that endurance, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So in this time, the endurance, the, the, the trials that we are going to go through, your disposition towards those trials every time will determine whether it will produce endurance in you or whether you will fall down in self-pity or whatever case it may be. And obviously nobody will blame you for feeling sorry for yourself, you know. Um, and, and it's not that we, will, we are uh, 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 told that we are not to be saddened that we are not to uh, cry over loved ones, that we, you know, that we're supposed to be the superhumans. This is about enduring in spite of it. And that we need to understand that nothing ever will happen to us that the Father did not allow. And that one day we will un understand. And soon, it will be soon that we will understand it. Okay, so... Let's go to verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So the first part is the trying of your faith in uh, verse 2 to 4. And then verse 12, it talks about temptation. And he says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them to them that love him. That love him. So remember, um, love is a, 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 a temptation during the time of wilderness, during the tribulation. It will be a matter of the heart of our love. Okay. So let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So there's only one that does the tempting, and we know who that is. But every man is tempted how is he tempted? When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived. Now think of lust as a seed, right? And when a seed is conceived, it means it is opened up and it's bringing forth life or it's bringing forth something, right? So when then, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it finishes, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. So think of that flame of love that dies. It's that death that it will bring. So the temptation brings forth uh, um, sin, and that sin brings forth death. And that's what it will bring in the end. And we know the enemy only needs a little gap. Just one little gap at a time to be able to open the door. So... Today, the gap is this big. Tomorrow, it's also this big. Tomorrow, or the day after that, it's also that big, that big, that big. Every day, just a little bit. And if we do not see those gaps in the light of the, the territory that it takes every time, without you knowing it, the door is wide enough for him to come in with so much more. So, what is the purpose behind uh, uh, um, temptation? The purpose behind temptation is to lure us, to ensnare us, to seduce us, and ultimately to cause us to fall away. So, 
like I said previously, how do we fall in love? You fall in love with the eye, with one look. Now, the same way um, temptation works also with eyes. You know, we know that um, Eve went in the Garden of Eden. She looked at the, the fruit and she said it was good to look at, right? So temptation starts with the eyes. Now, whether it's the physical thing you see or something that you see in your mind's eye, like the Israelites in the wilderness, they saw the flesh spots. They imagined it. They could probably smell it, you know, out of memory. So in order to be tempted to look something, you ultimately have to look away from what, that which you looked at. Now, Yeshua is saying, look unto me. Look to me. In the time that you are going through, you will need to look to me in everything. Your focus will have to be me. But the enemy will come through suffering, through temptation, and every purpose of him will be to cause you to look away from me. You want to know how to endure in this time? Look to me. Be conscious of what it means to look to me. Okay. So I thought, you know, let's get a bit practical with regards to this. In what way, you know, even now, not just in the time to come, even now, in what way um, is the enemy causing you to be tempted? And uh, the I've kind of put it in like little groups. Now, the first group I would call compromise. Okay, so there's three things in there that I want to highlight. There's probably so much more. But the first one is our desires. Now, desires is the, the most obvious, you know, whether it's um, the lust of the flesh with regards to food we eat, addiction, uh, uh, and, you know, you need to look at food to to appreciate it right um, it starts with that look um, uh, you know people are addicted to games people are addicted to movies people are addicted to various things and these things become their master and it just starts with a small opening right um, then uh, uh, um, people are even addicted to information they they and I say addicted because they're not aware, you know, a few people are actually aware how addicted they are. They crave new information. If I can just, you know, expose the enemy so much and more and more and more. And they, they get involved in, in all these uh, 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 conspiracy, uh, that word can almost fly out the window because nothing's a conspiracy anymore. Everything is just reality, you know, I suppose. But the point is people get so involved in it. That they take their eyes off the Lord because they, they there's there's a, a there's a lust for information, the knowledge that you know it's a tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, not just evil of good as well. So and people get a, a, a lust for evil as well, exposing evil, but without them knowing it, they they actually lust it. So it's very subtle. You have to be aware of that, of how much time you spend in that. Um, and obviously materialism, you know, money and, and things of this worth, because you, you look upon these things. So that is desires when it comes to compromise. The other thing is motives, you know. Remember, it's about our heart. Sometimes we are drawn away, looking away from him, because we, are, we, we have a desire to be used by him. And, and that sounds, you know, the motive sounds pure, but if that motive comes out of a negative or a poor self-image, then it is built upon wanting to please him for, for your end and not because you love him. And it's very easy, very subtle to feel that you are actually doing it for him. But in, in fact, you're doing it for yourself. That's why you can get people that feel so despondent because... They, they don't have certain gifts of the Spirit. And for them, it means that they, they're either not accepted by the Lord, they're not good enough, they feel ashamed, they feel rejected, they feel forsaken. There's various things that go through people's hearts and minds um, when they feel they are not being used by Him. And they lose focus on what they're busy with or what He is busy with them in their lives. And they want to run ahead. And so the moment they receive some other dream or vision, because a lot of people are very frustrated because they don't get dreams and visions. And so the moment where they get one single little thing, all of a sudden they're a prophet, or all of a sudden they, you know, they're mightily used by the Lord, and they run ahead 
because there's this absolute desire and craving to be able to be used by, them, by him. Because for them that equals I am loved and accepted. You see how subtle the enemy use our motives. And he needs to heal those who have still these issues. And you need to allow him to do that. Everything has its, its season and its time. So the other one is hunger. Now, I said hunger here because if you look at the example in Matthew 4 where Yeshua was tempted, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and the enemy knew that there's a natural desire of his body that obviously was hungry. And he said to him, you know, here's the stones. I know who you are. You know, you have the ability. Why not do this? It's, it's not wrong for you to want to eat, right? You're hungry, aren't you? It's a natural desire. There's nothing wrong with it. And so I use hunger here as an example because some people, they are hungry for healing. Hungry for healing. Who can blame them? They've suffered so much. They've endured so much and they're hungry for healing. There's people that are poor. They're hungry for provision. They are so hungry for uh, 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 certain things to happen in their lives. There's people that always um, had to do things the difficult way, you know, um, suffering tremendously because of uh, uh, maybe poverty, you know, and always having to have hand-me-downs, always have to have to depend on other people. So they're hungry to be able to provide for themselves. These are all natural desires, natural hungers. Who can blame a person? But the enemy knows how to manipulate these things in order to cause us to lean on our own understanding and not wait on the Lord God. You know, it's so easy when you want something so desperately and you've prayed for it and he has not answered you and the answer is still to come to maybe for the enemy to just, you know, you happen to see something on the internet, on YouTube, that could possibly solve your problem. And you could easily think, well, this is the Lord's provision. I'm sure he provided this. This must be him. And what do you do? You run with it. You do not wait on him. You do not question it. You do not discern because you're so hungry. And you know, when a person is hungry, what do they do? They don't eat little by little. They absolutely just, you know, push it into their mouth. They want it so desperately, the food. You know, what are you hungry for? And how? what an easy target are you for the enemy because you're so hungry for it that you'll grasp it in any spiritual things, that you'll grasp at anything because it is lawful. But the word says not everything that is uh, lawful is profitable, right? We have to understand, we have to wait on him because the enemy will use, I remember, when I got into uh, deception, I was hungry for the Lord. I was so hungry for the Lord. I wanted him to use me mightily. I, want, I just wanted more of him. That's what I wanted. I wanted more of him. And the enemy found a way to get me into something to deceive me. I was so grateful for that lesson. I really was. I would not be able to talk about this now in authenticity if it wasn't for that lesson. Now I can strengthen you and say, do not fall for the trap of an easy way to fulfill the desires of your heart that is even that of the desires of the spirit, meaning you wanting to do right by him. The enemy comes as an angel of light and he will use it. Okay, do not compromise, wait on the Lord. The second group is, I call it presumption. You know, presumption is taking advantage of the Lord God. And the first area that people often tend to take advantage, and it's very subtle, is that of forgiveness. You know, is forgiveness is a mercy unto us. And it's very easy to, to sin and have as a disposition, without you knowing it, I know I can just ask him forgiveness afterwards. I know he'll forgive me. You know, to abuse that forgiveness that he paid such a dear price for. And we know his mercy is everlasting. It's so great. And we abuse it. And all we think is, you know, tonight when I go to bed, I'll just ask forgiveness. There are people that does uh, that do that. So don't do that. Don't, don't be presumptuous. Don't test him. 
you know Yeshua said to the devil when he said you know uh, um, throw yourself off this off this uh, uh, temple mount um, he said that uh, he quoted Psalm 91 and he says didn't didn't he say that he will give his angels charge over you well the truth is there were stairs right you know sometimes the enemy says you know why don't you do this you know the Lord God and he will quote a scripture to help you out so sometimes the Lord God gives an escape by a stairs and not the easy way out so do not presume on him the other one with presumption apart from forgiveness is to lower our standard of holiness this also happens so subtly that we we especially when we watch things that um, uh, um, exposes the enemy a lot of times we can watch something that de that's defiling you know occultic stuff or we we are willing for the sake of truth to watch things that the spirit cannot place his eyes on and the spirit is in us and so we compromise with holiness we lower our standard we lower our standard with how we speak we lower our standard with regards to jokes we lower our standard with regards to whom we allow in our lives do not lower your standard holiness is the standard without holiness and um what is the one without holiness we will not see the lord god what is the other one peace walking in peace with others so the third one is ignoring the promptings of the spirit that is also presumption here we have the holy spirit the holy spirit every day speaking to us and we ignore that promptings we watch something and the lord god's name is used in vain we watch something and the F word is used. But for the sake of truth, we will show it to others. We uh, we listen to jokes that we shouldn't. And it falls very much in line with lowering the standard. But I'm referring to ignoring the spirit when the spirit, that still small voice, speaks to you and say, don't. These are the things that also causes the love of our hearts to grow dim. The first love in our hearts. The fourth one is procrastination, which is delayed obedience. You know, delayed obedience is still disobedience. So we procrastinate. We know what needs to be done, but we just don't feel like it. So day in and day out, things go by, or you do just, just that much to get by with. And we cannot procrastinate. Procrastination is the devil's playground. He knows as, as well as um, boredom. Boredom is a big thing. Be busy with the things of the Lord God. Do not allow the enemy to cause you to take your eyes off him and what needs to be done. Stay vigilant. And the fifth one is laziness. You know, laziness is it's kind of a... a, a, a um, there's the arrogance that comes with laziness is that of, I deserve it. You know, I've worked so hard. I, And it's not that the Lord doesn't want us to rest. But how often do you do it and how long, for how long? You know, laziness has a, a self-pity uh, element to it. It has that, uh, 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 it's also, you know, you kind of feel you need to reward yourself for something. So you indulge. It creates a, 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 a foothold for the enemy to come through indulgence. Be vigilant. If you do it often enough, that seed will conceive and it will produce sin. And the enemy will come in and your love will grow colder. Okay, now the third section, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't really fall into a section. But I suppose one can just look at it as um, um, various different things. And that is, the, the first one is distractions. Um, and, and through distractions, the enemy gets it right to get your focus, your eyes off him by, um, for instance, um, di different things that happens at home, uh, technological stuff that goes wrong, problems in the family, um, people that need your help, um, Various things that sins that you've given up a long time ago. People that you haven't seen for years all of a sudden pitch up. Um, 
thinks of this world, you know, what's happening in this world. All these things, remember I said that in order to catch your eye in temptation, you, the enemy lures your eyes away from the Lord God. Okay, so the second one there is suffering. Sometimes a person can go through so much suffering in your life that you define your relationship with the Lord as that of suffering. That's all you see. You know He loves you. You know He, he, he wants to help you. You know all those things. And you're working and you're diligent and you're enduring. But all you see is suffering day in and day out. It seems like there's no re uh, 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 repose. There's no time that you can just be. And without you knowing it, you start defining your relationship by suffering. As suffering. And the enemy gets it right then that that suffering ash smothers the love. It takes a concertive effort from you to get up from that place and take your eyes off the suffering and onto him. And by his grace, he will give you the mercy and the grace to be able to do his will, to not just define your relationship as that of suffering, because all suffering's end purpose is glory. Remember, I said suffering goes with glory. And he has a purpose with all our suffering, but there comes a time when that suffering ends. And it ends in his season, not yours. Not when you want it, when he wants it. But if you hold fast to him, if you hold fast to that love for him, remember love endures all things. You will be able to endure whatever you need to suffer so that at the end he will overflow you with his love. And he will provide. The third one is pride. You know, we, we come to a place where we take our eyes off him and we only look to what he does through us. So your eyes is off the face of his face and your eyes go to his hands. What he gives and what he does through you. And it's then so easy, easily for you to walk in pride. And uh, I remember once many years ago that the Lord said to me, your humility stinks. <laughs> Be very straight, straightforward, you know. Your humility stinks because it's false humility. It comes in the form of, oh, I'm so grateful that the Lord used me. Oh, look what the Lord has done for me. And, you know, there's, there's and it's so subtle. It's so subtle because you, you boast in what the Lord has done through you but the focus is actually you. And if we do not look at our hearts, if we do not stay uh, vigilant to that kind of pride, that religious pride that creeps in, you will easily think that you're the bee's knees and it's all about you and forget that it's all about him. Because he can take everything that you do away in a split second. And you must be willing that he does. That he can't take anything away. Your hand must always be open. Whatever he does through you or give you, he must be able to take anything away from you anytime, even your ministry, even your family, even your money, even your health, even your child, even your husband. He must be able to take anything because are you not a living sacrifice? Uh, it's very difficult what I'm saying here, but if you do not have that disposition, you will cling to it. Okay, and the last one is fear that takes our eyes off him. You know, fear has the ability to keep our eyes on that which is impossible for us when we look at it. Fear is the ability. You know, you get different fear of, uh, the one that comes to my mind is the fear of intimacy. There are people out there that have gone through so much pain and suffering that needs personal, um, emotional healing and spiritual healing. But they have been traumatized so much that they are willing to stay in that prison for as long as it takes because they just cannot be that vulnerable in his presence. And that fear causes you to only look on what you've experienced and that you're not willing to go through that again. You're not willing to deal with those things. You'd rather ignore it and keep it under the carpet, so to speak. And if you look at that and not look at him, 
you will not see the love, the compassion, you will not see the grace and the mercy that he will give for you to, in order to endure. You will look at the difficulty, the suffering and the vulnerability and you will not look to him. But when you look to him, all these things disappear and he gives you grace. You know, people have problems trusting him because of what they endured. But if you go to him and say to him, I do not trust you, you know that already. But you will give me the grace to trust you. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So there's a fear of intimacy. Then there's a fear of the cost. You know, I used to do that a lot. When he showed me things that he wants, that he will do through me, um, I would run. I would run. All of a sudden, I've got a lot to clean in my house, or I've got a lot of things to do, or, you know, all of a sudden, I'm very productive in, in, in anything but him. Because I, I took my eyes off him, and I, I, I placed my eyes, my focus, on the cost, what it will cost. And he wants us to understand. He knows how difficult it is for us. He knows how weak we are. That we must keep our eyes on him because if our eyes, the moment we take our eyes, it's very much like um, when you have to do something very difficult physically and somebody, your father says, stands in front of you and says, don't look down, just look at my eyes. Don't look down, just look at my eyes. This is exactly it. Telling us, do not look down. Do not look around you to the mountain. Do not look at everything else here. Just look to me. Look to me. And um, fear also of uh, um, the results, you know, of when we have to confront somebody maybe or, or have to do something. Sometimes we fear what will happen out of our obedience. And he wants us to understand that if we can trust him for the act of obedience, we can trust him for the result of obedience. The result of our obedience is not our problem, is not our responsibility. Only our obedience is our responsibility and he will give us the grace. But we can trust him with the results. And sometimes we fear results of our obedience and then we take our eyes off him and we only look at that and we, our imagination goes wild as we see these things that can possibly happen. And then in the end we decide we're either going to procrastinate or we're not going to do something at all. And the enemy steals time, the enemy steals joy, the enemy steals our focus, and ultimately our love grows dimmer and dimmer as time goes by. So let's read James 4, verse 4 to 10. This is his answer to us in this time, right? Ye adulteresses and adulteress, adulterers and adulteresses. Remember, we're talking about a love um, that's grown cold and turns to something else, right? Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Because it wants other things, right? But he giveth more grace. He'll give us the grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight, the eyes, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You know, the first thing that we are to do is to humble ourselves, is to break our hearts before him. If you realize today that your heart has actually grown cold and that you've You've been so focused on other things or you've allowed the enemy to tempt you with various small things and that you have 
fallen into the trap of saying the right thing, but you know that the love in your heart has grown cold. There's not that fervency and that longing. How many people long for the escape, but they do not long for him? They think they long for him because they know how to say the right thing. But they long for the escape from this world more than what they long for him. Their hearts have grown cold. So the first act is to humble ourselves. Then we resist the devil and he will flee from us. And it's from that position of humility that he says he will pick us up. This will remain our testing and our trial in the time to come. And I think what I want to say to you is, do you recognize the season that you are in? Do you recognize what it is that the enemy is, te- is he tempting you? Or is it the, the tempting of your love for the Lord God, for Yeshua? Or is it the, the, the tempt or the testing of the trial of your faith at the moment that you're in, or both? And is your disposition of such that you realize exactly what he is working in you? Are you focused on him? Has your love for him grown cold? And if your love for him grows cold now, how much more in the time to come? How much more vigilant do you need to be? You know, in Song of Solomon 8, the last chapter, it talks about the, 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 the bride. It says, who is this that comes out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Will we as the bride, as the workers, come out of the wilderness leaning on our beloved? It talks there about, she, she starts expressing her love for him. And she says, her love is so fervent for him. It's, it's, it's a zealous love. She says she's jealous. And that jealous in the Strong's is the same as zealous. It's a burning hot love. In this time to come, our love will either grow cold or it will grow piping hot for him. It is only that love that will cause us to endure. A love, a zeal for the kingdom of God and a love or a zeal for its king. That love is stronger than the grave. That love, many waters, cannot quench it. It cannot quench it. You know, ultimately what it requires of us, if we're going to ask ourselves now, what is necessary to help me not to fall into this trap? You know, Paul in Acts 17, he spoke on Mars Hill and he says to them that ultimately our purpose is to find him. It's to be found by him. And the Lord God says, if you'll seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. The ultimate purpose, it is all about him. And if you lose sight that everything is going to be and is about him, your eyes will be drawn away. Is everything you do today still about him? Is it still about him? When you do Bible study, is it still about him? Or is it about you? Is it about the time to come? Or is it about Him? Are you learning more about Him, His heart? Is He able to share His heart with you? You know, Yeshua said in John 5, He was speaking to the, um, the, the Pharisees and he, and he said to them, you, you seek for me and you seek for me in the Scriptures. And yet He was standing right in front of them. He was standing right in front of them. They sought him in the scriptures. They were diligent. In other words, they were seeking him in the letter, but not in the spirit. Are you seeking him in the letter, thinking that you're seeking him in the spirit? Because if you seek him in the spirit, you will find him. You won't just find knowledge. You won't just find understanding and revelation. You will find him. And when you find him, that love, that zeal, that flame will grow stronger and stronger. I implore you to seek him again in the scriptures for him. When you worship him, when you spend time, devotional time, do you spend time 
loving him? What is your vocabulary like when you speak to him? Do you say words like, I adore you? I love you so much that every part of my being yearns for you. Do you say words like that? Do you say to him, I cannot breathe without you? Do you say words like, deep is calling unto deep. My desire to be close to you in your presence overwhelms anything. I long for you. Is that your vocabulary? Do you speak? Not with lust. As some people don't know where the line is. But a devotion. That the spirit brings up in you. Because you speak by the spirit. Or do you get down to business? Lord, I need this, this and this and this. Do you long for him? Do you know what it is to be still, be quiet and wait for him to speak? To trust him to speak to you? Do you know what it is to just sit in his presence and enjoy that and that he doesn't have to speak? That just being in his presence fills your whole being. Can you do that? When last have you done that? When last have you looked in his eyes? When last have you allowed him to look into your eyes? I want to read you a word that he gave me on the 10th of January in this year. It's called Dove's Eyes. And he's speaking to the bride here. My bride has been captured, but not by me. She has been wooed but not by me. She has fallen, but not for me. As I stand with hand extended, she sees everything but me. And yet, I long to see her eyes. Those eyes of single devotion to me now. Those eyes that are drawn ever to me. Those eyes, those dove eyes that raptures my heart. But she does not see me, because she is searching, ever searching, but have still not found me. Right next to her, right next to her. Am I to be the jealous lover, vying for her attention, longing for one glance when I have not taken my eyes off her once? Am I to fulfill all her desires, whilst my desires lay barren? Yes, my dove, my sweet dove, I long for you. I long for you to become still and be. Just be in my presence so that you may listen. That I may draw you nearer, ever nearer. But you have roaming eyes. You no longer gaze long enough. No longer lost in me, but lost in in the world, lost in the happenings and have not seen me standing right next to you. The reality you long for is right next to you, my dove. As the world is driven more and more into the meta-reality, you are to be drawn more and more in me, not about me, but the reality of me. I long for just one of your gazes. I long for your dove's eyes. Come, my beloved. Come away with me. Let's pray. Yeshua, thank you for your love. That it is with loving kindness that you draw your bride. That you long for her to understand that this love is the love that will cause it to endure. A fervent love that waters will not be able to quench, that death will not be able to cause to be separated. A love that you will willingly pour out into a vessel if she'll take the time to gaze. 
I pray that everybody that hears this devotional will take it to heart, will search their hearts and ask, am I really still in that place? Am I authentically that which I speak? Has my focus been taken away by the enemy? In what way, Lord? To make that time to seek you afresh and draw near to you. I thank you for this, Father. I thank you. I thank you, Yeshua, that you're coming for a bride that's madly in love with you.